Now, we are going to be talking to Rachel in just a few minutes about this. We are in year nine of the war in Iraq, and this ninth year will be the war's very last. Because today, in an unexpected announcement, President Obama told the American people that the war in Iraq was ending. Definitively and absolutely, the war is over. I can report that, as promised, the rest of our troops in Iraq will come home by the end of the year. Over the next two months, our troops in Iraq, tens of thousands of them, will pack up their gear and board convoys for the journey home. The last American soldier will cross the border out of Iraq with their held, heads held high, proud of their success, and knowing that the American people stand united in our support for our troops. That is how America's military efforts in Iraq will end. For as long as there has been an Iraq war, for as long as there have been people arguing in favor of starting a war in Iraq, there have been people on the other side of it arguing against it. And one of those people arguing against it in very early stages was the man who announced today that that war was ending. And when President Obama said this afternoon that it was ending, quote, as promised, he was talking about himself, about his own promise to the American people that he would be the president to end the war in Iraq. President Obama's opposition to the war went back years to the beginning of it, to a now famous 2002 speech he gave as a state legislator in Chicago. I don't oppose war in all circumstances. And when I look out over this crowd today, I know there is no shortage of patriots or patriotism. What I do oppose is a dumb war. Five months later, President George W. Bush ordered American forces to invade Iraq through Kuwait. Because we were told over and over again Iraq was responsible for 9-11, and Iraq had weapons of mass destruction, and Iraq wanted to use them against the free world. We know that Iraq and al-Qaeda have had high-level contacts that go back a decade. We've learned that Iraq has trained al-Qaeda members in bomb-making and poisons and deadly gases. Iraq has sent bomb-making and document forgery experts to work with al-Qaeda. Iraq has also provided al-Qaeda with chemical and biological weapons training. He's a threat because he is dealing with al-Qaeda. Simply stated, there is no doubt that Saddam Hussein now has weapons of mass destruction. There is no doubt that he is amassing them to use against our friends, against our allies, and against us. Iraq's weapons of mass destruction are controlled by a murderous tyrant who has already used chemical weapons to kill thousands of people. We know he's been absolutely devoted to trying to acquire nuclear weapons. Those claims about al-Qaeda and the weapons program all turned out to be 100 percent grade A hooey. They were not true. And outside the Cheney family dinner table, no one argues they are true anymore. Just like no one thinks the pre-pre-pre-premature mission accomplished declaration was a good idea. But once those things were clear, the discussion of the war in Iraq, the argument about it, didn't then turn to, okay, how do we end this thing? Instead, in 2007, the question was, how many more Americans do we send to fight there? Remember that? The surge? President Bush deployed 20,000 more American troops to the war in Iraq to give the Iraqi government the breathing space to stabilize so that a political resolution in Iraq could be reached and then ultimately the troops could come home. That was the idea. Now, the catastrophic violence in Iraq declined a bit, but as far as a stable government, that didn't happen. That still hasn't happened. Iraq had a parliamentary election last year, and it took nine months for them to form a government. Nine months of grinding political stalemate. But while the troop buildup was going on in Iraq in 2007 and into 2008, back home here in the United States, two very important things were going on. First, Senator Barack Obama, the man famous for that anti-Iraq war speech, he was running for the Democratic presidential nomination. And at the center of his argument for why he should be president was the promise that he'd end the war. He ran for president successfully as the anti-Iraq war candidate. The other important thing back here at home happened with very little notice. Before leaving office, President Bush made a security agreement with the Iraqis. That agreement, the Status of Forces Agreement, set the timetable for gradual, many say too gradual, withdrawal of U.S. troops. And then, a couple of years later, this happened. 
President Obama ordered all U.S. combat troops out of Iraq by August 31st, 2010. And NBC's chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, was there. In fact, NBC and MSNBC were the only television networks to carry it live as U.S. troops left Iraq the way they came in, driving across the border with Kuwait. Now, the point of the troop surge, the escalation, was to give the Iraqi government the opportunity to succeed. And today, the president said that the troop de-escalation actually gave the United States a different kind of opportunity, all its own. The drawdown in Iraq allowed us to refocus our fight against al-Qaeda and achieve major victories against its leadership, including Osama bin Laden. The Iraq war will have lasted almost nine years. Almost 4,500 American troops were killed and more than 30,000 were wounded. And now the war is finally ending. And not with a raucous Victory Day parade, but with a conversation between President Obama and the Iraqi Prime Minister. You can see him here on the screen. And with a somber, short announcement by the President that over the next two months, 40,000 Americans would be coming home. And not one American would be getting notice that he or she had to ship out to replace them. So joining us now is NBC's chief foreign correspondent, Richard Engel, who was in Iraq at the time that the troops started coming home in August. It's really nice to see you. Well, thanks for having me on. It is a very significant day and a day I, I'm still touched by that moment when the president said all the troops are going to be home for the holidays. Yeah. And there have been a lot of people who've wanted to make that statement. And he said it today very nonchalantly and said, well, we, there was a, an agreement in the works to leave a few thousand troops there beyond, and that agreement fell through. So they're all coming back. Yeah, it, it is a moment of privilege. I, I think I will always remember just now saying, the war is over, right? The war is ending. <laughs> the war it's is not ending. over yet. <laughs> we, right. uh, we'll be back in, in two months and we'll have that conversation. Well, well, actually, I wanted to ask you exactly about that. I mean, why was this such a surprising day? I mean, this um, status of forces agreement has been in place. Why is today so surprising? There are about 39,000 U.S. troops there right now on a training mission. So the combat mission is over. So troops aren't going out and invading cities anymore. That mission ended about a year ago in that footage that, that you showed when we came out with that, that convoy. Sure. But since then, there has been this tens of thousands of troops training Iraqi forces officially deployed right. in uniform, on a mission, sent to Iraq, serving on bases. That was supposed to end always at the, at the conclusion of this year. But there was talk, mostly coming from different Iraqi factions. Mm. They wanted to leave a residual force of 2,000, 3,000, 5,000. The exact number was never made very clear beyond 2011 as a, as a tripwire, as a mm -hmm. safeguard in case things went wrong and the Civil War came back. And the problem was, and, and this, I think, benefits the Iraqi people much more than the U.S. would have gotten a, a benefit from this. The problem was certain... Iraqi politicians, uh, particularly Muqtad al-Sadr, thought this was giving in to the occupation, extending mm -hmm. the occupation, and the Prime Minister Maliki was getting beat up domestically over this. And the U.S. was putting some pressure on the Iraqis, saying, listen, time, we have a timeline here. Yeah. You've got to make up a decision. And then when the ultimate decision came down and Maliki told the president, we can't promise these troops immunity, President Obama said, fine. We're done. We're done. We're, we're done. And, and, and so this is the big question, right? I mean, the anxiety here is the idea that there still may be some residual possibility of civil war that that are that we don't know exactly that our withdrawal is, is better or worse. But 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 let me ask. Civil yeah. war might happen. Yes. Yeah. There could be a civil war uh, in Iraq and the indications are not good on the ground. Yeah. Um, sectarian killings are coming back. Car bombings are coming back. Yeah. Kur the Kurds are, you know, one particular militant group in the north it has decided to go berserk and attack Turkey, provoking a major uh, retaliation from Turkey. Things, Iran is moving. Things are not good in Iraq right now. But would three, four thousand troops that don't have any kind of immunity in a training mission that is opposed by a large section of the society been enough to stop a potential civil war or all these other uh, negative influences that are going on in the country? Probably not. Right. So this is the question for us is we're, we're facing this moment where it's not all perfect. We've been there nearly not all perfect. <laughs> a country could collapse and, right, uh, it's momentarily. Hardly, yeah. Right. But but somehow our occupation our staying there also does not build the wall against that happening. Not that with not with 
not with two, three thousand trainers who are there without any kind of immunity, without any kind of legal framework. Um, if the United States wanted to make sure that Iraq was going to be a success, we'd have to stay there with large numbers of troops and large commitment. And, and, and maybe even that is not going to ensure it's a success. There's two ways of looking at it. Yeah. The training wheels are coming off. So the Iraq bicycle is either going to fall down mm -hmm. and everyone's going to get very badly bruised and cut up, or they're going to have to start pedaling harder and they're going to have to realize that this is their moment. They really have to take responsibility for themselves. And let's hope it's the latter. Let's hope not only for the question of American involvement, well, but much more fundamentally for this nation. Who's for this nation, also for the United States. If there is a gap in the Middle East, that's a problem for the United States. Yep. If there is a hole in the Middle East and Iran is more empowered and there is rising tension or military conflict between Kurds and Turkey and there is ongoing civil strife within Iraq, that's bad for the United States, frankly. So we have a stake in this as well. And what happens in Iraq will influence, will influence the United States, will influence the region, certainly, and will influence what we have done, the legacy of, of all these soldiers, of all these ideals that were put on the table. If you were an American soldier and you served three deployments there and you lost your best friend there, what you don't want to see this to fail. That's right. There, there, there is still a, a reason for us to care about these outcomes in a very, very critical way. Absolutely. Richard, always, it is a pleasure to talk to you. And we'll talk in two months and you're going to get to say that <laughs> statement, say the Iraq war, war is now is truly over. over. It's a really, it's, it sends chills up one's spine to it's, say that. It's quite a moment.